Growth hormone is probably the most controversial issue, and you have to be careful um, in terms of uh, if you're going to prescribe growth hormone because the FDA really um, is on like a war path, and they will throw you in jail uh, if you don't do the right testing and to document that they really have <clears throat> adult onset growth hormone deficiency. So I'm going to focus on adult on onset growth hormone deficiency, not going to talk about children. Um, I, in my previous my training, we, I, I was exposed to uh, short stature for kids, so I felt comfortable in uh, treating them in my previous practice, but I'm basically doing wellness. And I want to start off with basically uh, just a basic descri disc description of growth hormone. Uh, growth hormone, as you know, comes from the pituitary gland. So what I tell my patients is, because um, most patients have no idea where the pituitary gland is, so I, I tell them, imagine if I put a pencil through my ears and a pencil between my eyes, uh, and where the two pencils meet, that's your pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland secretes uh, many hormones, but one of them is uh, growth hormone. And growth hormone was actually discovered by my cousin, uncle, no, by Dr. Lee, same last name, but... Uh, we're not related. He was an endocrinologist, uh, I think in Chicago. Um, he's, I think, of Chinese descent. And that was in um, 1955. Um, so anyway, uh, growth hormones come a long, long way. And just for historical reference, this is the shortest woman ever in the world. And uh, growth hormone deficiency, I don't think you see this that often, but, uh, you know, they've had, a lot of people were had growth hormone deficiency there. The thing that I really liked when I was in my previous practice was that uh, I was able to help kids of short stature because they were getting picked on. They, they had really low, low, very low self-esteem. Um, kids are cruel. They, they were suffering academically. They just basically, it was always the smallest one. And, and to, to see them actually grow on growth hormone, that was really rewarding. That was probably the best part of when I was doing um, conventional endocrine, uh, was helping these uh, young kids grow. Now, to review this kind of pathway of growth hormone, um, the hypothalamic area, which is above the pituitary, uh, can secrete a hormone called uh, uh, GHRH, which is growth hormone releasing hormone. That can stimulate the pituitary to secrete growth hormone. Now, you Remember, when growth hormones, um, if you try to check um, through the blood, you're generally going to have very low growth hormone in the blood if you check it randomly throughout the day because it's secreted pulsatile. And the thing is that it's generally secreted highest like 3 o'clock, 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock in the morning. That's where your restorative phase is. That's why it's so important to get good night's sleep. And for a lot of my patients that come in with basically low growth hormone, uh, I can see significant improvement by just improving their sleep. And it's not just the quantity of sleep, it's the quality of sleep. So if they have sleep apnea, you've got to correct that, and you'll see significant improvement of the growth hormone. But you can't really follow just the blood test growth hormone. You have to follow with IGF-1, which growth hormone goes to the liver, and the liver basically secretes the hormone called IGF-1. That's considered your active growth hormone. Now, there are other inhibitors and factors that in increases growth hormone. Um, and I just want to tell you that uh, it's much more complicated than this. This is uh, from an an actually from Endocrinology and Metabolism Clinic. And you can see here that uh, there's growth hormone releasing hormone from the, from the hypothalamic uh, activating the pituitary. There's a hormone called ghrelin. Um, and then there's leptin, free fatty acid, and also uh, leptin. So there's some adamidin, and there's probably other things now that are influencing the release of growth hormone. So it's all about balance. And the thing is that uh, our fat cells are, it's now considered an endocrine gland, and because there's uh, hormones secreted from the fat cells, like leptin and adiponectin and other hormones. Um, so once IGF-1 secreted, it's this is where you become anabolic. A lot of patients that you see probably are catabolic. They're wasting away. 
Uh, there's a catabolic phase, anabolic phase, and you want to be anabolic where you build muscle and keep your bone density strong. If you have too much cortisol or your, <clears throat> and not enough of your anabolic hormone, you're going to be catabolic. And there's some tests you can do to see if someone's on the catabolic phase or if they're, quote, in the normal reference or if they're more in the anabolic phase. There's companies out there that actually you can see uh, through through your intestine to see exactly if they're in the anabolic catabolic phase. So you really don't want to be in the catabolic phase because that's where you lose uh, your mean um, your your uh, muscle mass and you tend to gain more fat and uh, you're becoming sarcopenic. You're losing muscle mass. So there are stimulators for growth hormone and uh, this is a list. But the most important two most important thing I tell my patients all the time is you got to sleep. And so many of my patients, and probably your patients also, they don't sleep well. Um, they don't get enough sleep. They're on the internet way too late. There's always, you know, one more thing to do. It's stress, 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 stress. And I really emphasize that to my patients. You, you, know, you have to make sleep as your number one priority. Now, if you go to bed at, you know, 2 a.m. and get up 5 and you're exhausted, you got to basically try to slowly get back to um, good quality sleep so that you can get uh, seven to eight hours of sleep. Um, and uh, usually I tell my patients, you know, move, move it back the clock 30 minutes and rather than f f jump back like three hours earlier, which that, that's too, too rough of a transition, just gradually bring it back. But sleep, I've seen so many people who have low IGF-1s under 100 and they're now like, you know, 180, 190 with just, just sleep and exercise. That's number two. You have to exercise. If you don't exercise, you're not going to get your IGF-1 up. So that's really important. Now you see on this list, there's low level of blood glucose. And I'm going to talk about that later, because there's a test you can do that to actually document uh, adult onset growth hormone deficiency. Um, dietary and protein is important, but uh, I just learned yesterday uh, on a lecture, or was it two days ago, about L-arginine and the pathway to uh, basically nitric oxide. But uh, L-arginine is supposed to, it's an amino acid that's supposed to increase the release of growth hormone. But it's, it's kind of a complicated pathway. But uh, if L-arginine doesn't go the right pathway to make nitric oxide, it actually can actually go to a, a free radical called oh no And that's even worse. That's the O-O-N-O that can actually cause more damage. Um, and then um, there's arginine right there on the bottom there. So the inhibitors of growth hormone, here's a list. Um, and insulin resistance, or if you have high blood sugars, it's, you're not going to improve. So you're going to have to basically get those blood sugars down. I always preach lifestyle modification and um, basically exercise and, and, and also try to reduce your uh, sugar intake. Um, I really thought uh, yesterday's lecture with JJ uh, was amazing. Uh, and um, this is the problem with growth hormone, because you have a lot of some athletes who are abusing growth hormone, and you can now have the professional athletes. And um, anyway, Jose Conseco even admitted the use of growth hormone. He felt much younger. Um, and the thing is that uh, it's it's... Inhibit, well, it's prohibited in the professional uh, arena, and I do have a lot of professional athletes in my, in my uh, practice. And, uh, you know, they're always asking, can I go in growth hormone? It's like, well, if you're a professional athlete, I can't, you know, if, even if you qualify, maybe you can get a uh, waiver, but uh, we can do the testing and see. But usually uh, they don't qualify, and uh, unfortunately I can't give them human growth hormone, but I can try to get their growth hormone naturally. So that's what I try to do in my practice. So somatopause is another name for growth hormone deficiency. You know, you have andropause. Now, the somatopause, that's the technical word for growth hormone deficiency. And uh, the, the question is, do you have insufficiency or, de or deficiency? And there's that whole controversy. You know, I, I see a lot of people that can benefit gro from growth hormone but they're insufficient, but they don't have, they don't truly meet the definition of deficiency. And that's where you can get in trouble. And uh, I'll, I'll explain the difference there. But growth hormone, just to, just to recap, 
secreted from the hypo, actually from the pituitary gland, it goes to the liver, secretes IGF-1, and IGF-1 is your active growth hormone, but it also binds to something called the binding protein 3, well, there, which is um, a carrier. And there are basically, uh, I'll, I think on the next slides, there's six other binding proteins. But uh, anyway, IGF-1 is more stable, and you can measure it throughout the, throughout the day, and you're not going to have that wide swings of growth hormone. Because if you check random growth hormone, like I say, it's generally going to be like down to like 0.5 or very low. Whereas an IGF-1, you'll be able to have a, um, a level that's basically sustained throughout the day. And if you check growth hormone throughout the day, you, you may pick it up as, the pulsatile, as it secretes pulsatile, but uh, generally it's going to be very low on growth hormone. So IGF-1, basically the half-life when it's bound to the binding protein 3 is 20 hours. And uh, you should measure IGF-1 and IGF binding protein 3. So actions of IGF-1 is, this is, I tell this to my patients, it's actually your active growth hormone. It uh, stimulates cell growth, and um, basically our cells are programmed to die. And in theory, basically IGF-1, higher levels of it, basically slows down that clock. And every, almost every cell in our body basically has the IGF-1 receptor 